So good afternoon, everybody. Have you, uh, have you gotten enough sugar? You ready to go? Amped up? I know that, I know that the, night, the speaker that we're going to bring up, she's amped up. She's always amped up. Um, as you all know, I'm sure, uh, this is Katie Novak's session, uh, UDL implementation, uh, um, sharing the love with parents. So let me tell you a little bit about Katie. I'm going to read it directly from here, and then I'm going to, I'm going to freestyle. Uh, so, uh, Katie Novak is an internationally renowned education consultant, as well as a pract uh, practicing leader in education as the assistant superintendent of schools in Massachusetts. <clears throat> With 14 years of experience in teaching and administration, uh, an earned doctorate, doctorate in curriculum and teaching, and three books published by CAS Professional Publications, Katie designs and presents workshops both nationally and internationally focusing on implementation of universal design for learning, multi-tiered systems of support, and universally designed leadership. Now let me tell you, I've had Katie out in Michigan, um, and I consider myself a... Uh, 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 Katie Groupie. Um, all of that is great, but what you are in store for in this amount of time is an experience. How many people have seen Carrie, uh, Katie speak before? Okay, so don't say anything to anybody that hasn't. Okay, it's about it's about to go it's about to go down. So let me so help me welcome the UDL rock star Katie Novak to the stage. Hello. So the first thing I want to do is just take a picture of this room because this room is kind of like the anti-UDL setup. So I'm going to take a quick picture just so I can get it in all its glory, okay? And then our first task is going to be, I'm going to leave the room for two and a half minutes on a timer and you're going to turn it into a UDL dream for when I come back. Okay, so I am giving you executive privileges to move around chairs, you know, to take those tables in the back. You know, if you break anything, blame it on me. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna make this a comfy place to collaborate and talk and to learn. Because if you've seen me before, I'm not big into just standing up here and talking. Because if you wanna do that, you can call me on the phone. It's all about the interactions that we're gonna have together. And since you only have like one person next to you when we're in lines, I want you to turn this into UDLtopia. Okay, so you have Dean over here with the muscles if you need him to move anything. And this is all gonna be captured on live camera, but we are gonna make like this traditional room into a UDL paradise in two and a half minutes. So ready, I'm out, go.
I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. And so what you just did is an example of self-directed creative problem solving in that I gave you a goal, make a comfortable learning environment for yourself where we can optimize conversation. Um, there's numerous options. So again, there's some backup seats Some people are on the floor, but it's all about the fact that we really need the opportunity each and every day to personalize our learning environment, to personalize what we're learning about, how we're learning about it and what we're going to do with it because learning ultimately is action oriented. We want action. And so a big part of this when you're doing it at a district level is involving parents in this process as well. And so how do we, first of all, personalize the parental support experience for all of our parents? How do we get them on board and engaged with the fact that we're creating a universally designed district where students are going to have many, many opportunities to solve problems and be creative without the direction that maybe they used to receive? because ultimately it's not what we do for our students, but what we teach students to do for themselves. And parents are a huge part of that village. And so I just wanna start off by talking about the goals and objectives. Simon Sinek, he wrote uh, Start With The Why and said that really successful businesses and organizations always start off by asking why they do what they do. And he said a lot of businesses always start off with what do we do? Well, we teach kids. How do we do it? We implement universal design for learning. But why do we teach kids? Why do we do this work? So I just want you to take a minute and turn to someone next to you because now you're in a comfy place, your feet are up, feel free to move anytime to make yourself comfortable and talk about why are you in the work that you're doing, okay? And, and we forget that sometimes, especially you know in administration, you sometimes get bogged down in, in the details, in the curriculum adoption, in the meetings, in the HR, in the discipline. But that's not why we do what we do. So why do you do what you do? Talk about it for just one minute and I'll come around and try to touch base with a few of you. Okay, so the goal is now that we know why we're doing this, it's really about that we want what is best for kids. We want all kids to be successful. We want all kids to have equal opportunities to, to enjoy their lives. And here's the, here's the thing, here's the secret. Parents want the same thing. The reason why we need to work together is we want the same thing. And our interpretation of what that thing is, is made a little different. But if you ask any parent, I have four kids of my own, if you ask any parent, they are doing the best they know how to do with the kids that they have because they want them to be successful. 
Okay, that's every parent's want, and that's every teacher's want. And for some reason, there's a conflict a lot of the time when there really shouldn't be. And so we're going to talk about why the connection with parents as partners is so critical for education, because we want to transform teaching and learning for all of our kids. We're also going to talk about what parent engagement is. What does it look like? And then lastly, how are you going to start to create your village? Because we cannot do this alone. We're not with our kids enough. We need the whole community to be behind this idea of creating expert learners. And so I want to start off with a little analogy and I'm just going to play this song and we're going to talk about whatever state you were in. Is this song, have you ever heard this before? Oh, come, this is silly. I may not be plugged in, but I can wing it. Okay, there we go. So, in... <laughs> That is nice. Did anyone have a different ice cream truck song? They're all like equally annoying probably. But anyway, you hear the song and you're psyched. Okay. Oh my goodness, stop. So, oh, it's never ending. It's never ending. So you hear the ice cream truck song and you get really, really excited. When kids are little and they go to school, they get really, really excited. Okay? And again, something happens along the way. And I argue that this is an ice cream truck phenomenon. And the reason that parents and students get frustrated with education is because, you know, they hear about education is the great equalizer. You know, it offers something for everyone. It really does. And, you know, there's so many statistics about, you know, the longer you're educated, the better you'll do in life. And there's so much about, you know, an education can get you anywhere. And so we run up to it and we embrace it and we're so excited. And then you say, oh my gosh, this is what I want. Now, here's the problem. I'm, I drive an ice cream truck. Brian, what do you want to eat at the ice cream truck? I love no, I don't have those. Sorry. Um, anyone else? Chocolate ice cream. Nope, don't have it. Um, the problem is, is I only serve pralines and cream ice cream, but it's awesome. Believe me, it's awesome because I am an awesome ice cream maker. And so what happens a lot of the time is we provide an education that so much time and so much passion has gone into. And so we don't want to minimize the fact that a traditional education that is, that is quote unquote one size fits all was was made very lovingly. So if I sat and made pralines and cream ice cream, I could have taken the time to get the best ingredients and to find all these different recipes and try it out over and over. And I finally make it and I say, look at this, I have this for you. And you're running up expecting something else and you're like, wait, I'm not eating that. And there's two reasons why you're not going to eat it, okay? So on the count of three, I want you to yell out the reason that you're not going to eat the pralines and cream ice cream if you would refuse to have it, ready? One, two, three. Okay, there was, I heard half was that it doesn't interest you. I don't like it, I don't know what it is, that's not chocolate, and the other half was you can't access it. Lactose intolerant, nut allergy. And so the reason that students are not successful in our schools, and the reason that parents can't successfully interact with teachers and administrators and be involved in school, is either they're not interested, I don't get it, what's the point, why would I do that? I only want to come to basketball games. Or they can't access it. They're incarcerated. Drug addiction. Lack of transportation. Work schedule. And when we expect everybody to do things in the same way, we are not educating in a world that is, that is equitable to all. And so the idea is that we have to create a community where everybody has the potential to be really successful. Parents have the potential to be really successful for their kids, to advocate for their kids, to be involved in school. Students have the potential to become self-directed creative problem solvers. And administrators and teachers have the potential to make these relationships and these partnerships matter. Now, Malcolm Gladwell, which this morning um, was discussed, and um, he wrote the book Outliers, and the second chapter of Outliers is called 10,000 Hours, and he was really looking into what is the secret of success, and we all want to say it's the people who work the hardest. That makes us feel better. If you work hard, you can accomplish anything. And that's actually not true. It's a really awesome read. It's you were smart enough, baseline. You were working hard enough, baseline. And the magic of the equation is you had 10,000 hours to practice.
and he has never once found an exception in anybody who is an outlier or successful than more than like 99% of people in their field. So when you look at Bill Gates, when you look at um, Steve Jobs, we want to say, well, they're just more creative. They're just more successful. It was because Bill Gates, by happenstance, went to the only high school in the entire United States that had a, a computer that could be multi-programmed. And so before he graduated, he could log the hours that he needed. And so it's all of these stories. And so every single learner we have, every parent, every student is capable of expert learning. Okay? Everyone is capable of being self-directed and creative and problem solver. The problem is, is it's not happening yet. And it's really tempting to say, well, they can't. But it's not that they can't, it's that they're not yet. So Carol Dweck wrote uh, Growth Mindset, and, um, or the, the book Mindset, and does a lot of work in growth mindset. And right there, that's a ski mountain. I'm from Massachusetts, and skiing is really big in New England. And that is a double black diamond. Now, how many of you ski? Okay, no, we're not a big skier group here. Okay, so would any of you look at that and go, yeah, like I could probably do that. Maybe you could do it back in the day, maybe you can do it now. But how many of you would say, I could, I could do a black diamond? Now, how many times have you gone skiing? You mean not like twice? Okay, because how often, let's be honest, how often do we try something with kids five, 10, 20 times and say, see, they can't do it. I've invited that parent three times. They're not coming, they can't do it, they can't be involved. Okay, 10,000 hours, hundreds of times is what it takes to get there. And some parents are there already, and some kids are there already, and some aren't there yet. But every single person is capable of coming together for success for these kids. If we think of parent community as education, as another audience of stakeholders to teach. And so when we think about the UDL guidelines, which you're familiar with, we think about these three parts of the brain, obviously, and we want to make sure that they can recognize information and that they can become self-directed and actually action-oriented and that they're, they're engaged, that they are interested and that they know how to commit and to cope. And when we think about this, we often look at this as students' brains. But I want you to think for a second about parents' brains. And the fact that if you want a parent to come into school and be really involved in their kids' lives, you first of all have to recruit their interest. They have to know it's important. Secondly, they have to be committed enough to sustain effort and persistence when other things come up. Okay? Because all of us are really busy. And then we have to go out and remove the barriers that are preventing parents from coming in. And there's a lot of different creative ways to do that and we're gonna talk about it in a little bit. But again, we're thinking about the UDL guidelines as not only a lens for students, but as parents as well. And so we're gonna play a, a, little, a little game here. Is This is um, the Rios model of engagement. And I really like it because it talks about engagement as being high attention and high commitment. And if you look at the UDL guidelines, this is absolutely true. Because when you're recruiting interest, you're trying to get high attention. And when you're trying to get commitment, you're looking for them to foster effort and persistence and to self-regulate. Okay, that's what it means to commit. It means to overcome when it's tricky. And so when you're engaged, you're in like this sweet spot. And where most of our students are gonna be is gonna be in this middle section here, okay? Research tells us this, that mostly kids are here, okay? They're compliant, which means they'll pay attention in class. And they'll nod at parent night. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that, that sounds good. Yeah, I'll help them with homework every night. And then there's a barrier. And when there's a barrier, someone who is compliant is not going to be committed to solve that problem and overcome that barrier. And somebody who is engaged will. So let me just give you a really ridiculous example of a time in my life where I was very engaged. And then I want you to think about kind of how this impacts your practice. So when I was, um, a couple years ago, I have four little ones, and my husband is a salesperson, and he ended up hitting his number for the year, and we won a trip to Hawaii. And through the stars aligning, some people have decided to watch our children for five days, which is like never happened ever. So all four kids are taken care of. We have a free trip to Hawaii. Everything is good. Okay, so, you know, obviously I'm engaged, right? I want to go to Hawaii. Okay, but the whole idea of commitment is doing whatever it takes to get to Hawaii. So what happens? I'm from Boston. There's a snowstorm. The flight is canceled. They say, we can't get you out on Saturday. We can't book you again until Wednesday. 
well, the trip's over Friday. I don't want to go for three days. And they're like, well, I'm sorry. There's nothing I can do. Okay. If I said, okay, that would be compliant. You told me I couldn't do it. I accept that. I can't do it. I was like, heck no. So we called Hartford. We called Manchester. We called JFK in New York. We called Pittsburgh. We called Philadelphia. Philadelphia had a flight that if we could get there in 13 hours, it would get us to Hawaii. We're like, book it. Okay? They're like, we'll transfer the flight. Your flight was canceled. You don't have to pay any extra. Get to Philadelphia. We're like, great. That is eight hours from our house. How are we going to get there? Okay, we got to rent a car. Well, Logan Airport is shut down. So we drive two hours to rent a car in Providence, to drive overnight, to get to Philadelphia, to leave at 5 a.m. in the morning. We get to Hawaii. We get to Hawaii. He's texting all his friends. Where are you guys? Oh, no, no, you can't get there till Wednesday. We're not going. That's commitment and, and engagement. And that's a silly example from my life. But if you think about the students you have that are really successful and the parents you have that always make it there, it's not because it's easy. It's never easy. It's because they were committed enough to remove the barriers, to solve the problems that were getting in the way of their participation. And if you can't do that, then you end up retreating or rebelling. And so I'm going to give you an example how all of us can really go down this road very, very quickly. I'm going to give you a topic and you're going to imagine that this is really what I'm talking about for the next couple hours. Okay. And you're going to decide if you would be really engaged or you'd be really rebellious. Okay. So if you'd be engaged, you're going to kind of go to this side of the room, just kind of like get up and walk this way. Like, yeah, I'd be into it. And if you'd be rebellious, which means, you know, you'd start being fresh. Like you're no longer paying attention to me in this room, but you'd be like, you know, texting or oh, going to the bathroom is kind of like retreating. Okay. But like, okay. So imagine I said, okay, guys, we're going to get up right now and we're just going to square dance for the next hour. I'm a really good square dancing instructor, okay? And I say, you have to do this, okay? Now, how many of you would be like, yeah, that's actually fun, I'll do it, I don't care. And you're gonna walk over here and go, yeah, I'm engaged. And commitment would be like, yeah, whatever, I don't, I, I'll do it. I don't wanna do it, but I'll do it. And then rebellion is, you're gonna be like, oh, this is not gonna go well, you're gonna be fresh. And if you think about where you would go, we're all gonna be in different places. And so how many of you would be in either engagement or strategic compliance? Okay. And how many of you would be kind of retreating like, oh, voting with my feet, going to another session. And how many of you know you'd start getting fresh, making jokes, tripping your friend? That would be me. Yeah. But uh, the, the reason that you slide back and forth is number one again, do you care enough about it? But that's only a very little part, is can you solve the problems and remove the barriers in order to get there? And so I wanna talk for a little bit about just this idea of hidden curriculum and what hidden curriculum we have in our family engagement. But what I wanna do first is give you an opportunity just to talk with each other. So again, feel free to move your chairs, sit on the floor. I'm gonna give you three or four minutes to talk about currently how do you engage with parents, whether you're a teacher, an administrator, a consultant. So if you're a consultant and you don't work one-on-one -on -one with parents, how often do you talk about working with parents? So just think about your focus on getting parents involved in their Students' education, what is it? So let's do four minutes. I'll put on a timer.
Okay, so when we think about how do we currently interact with parents, many schools will say, well, we do our back to school night and whoever comes, comes. We send home report cards, okay. Um, we send emails home, you know, we send the weekly newsletter um, and we have conferences. That's a fairly typical traditional parent engagement strategy. The problem is, is that does not reach all parents nor have the needs of all parents. First of all, parents who work at night are pretty much completely counted out of that. Um, parents who don't have transportation are counted out of that. Um, parents who you know, don't understand how the report card is designed you know, a lot of districts are moving towards a standards-based grading or, you know, different types of proficiency learning where the parent, it doesn't even make sense anymore. And so it's all about this idea of how involved are parents in the decisions that we are making to change things like report cards and open house nights and parent meetings. And then also, you know, how responsive are we to all of their suggestions? And so in 1980, Jean Anion, she was an education psychologist, and she was actually looking at what was different about classrooms that serve students of different socioeconomic status. And so she called them, like a working class school was one of them, and she went along the spectrum and there was middle class, upper middle class, affluent, elite. And what she expected to find was very different curriculum. And what she found is that there really isn't different curriculum back in 1980 and back now. So regardless of where you're at, either from 30 different states, I can tell you which math program you're using. There's like seven, you know, investigations, envisions, Eureka, Engage New York, um, Focus, like all, you know, we know the math programs. We know you're using a writer's workshop or you're using a basil or, and so when we start thinking about curriculum, it wasn't different then and it's not different now. And what she coined, which I'm like in love with to this day, is this idea of hidden curriculum, which is how you're perpetuating the status quo. And it was not about the curriculum or what the teacher's giving out, but how students were empowered to think as individuals. And so when she went into working class schools, parents were very, I'm sorry, teachers were very, very focused on following rules. And, and these teachers loved the kids. In no way is this a negative slant. But success in these working class schools was you do what I say and you'll be successful. 
raise your hand, yes ma'am, no ma'am, um, why are we doing this today? That is really a disrespectful question. You can't ask me that. This is what we're doing today and this is why. Um, you really can't ask questions. It was very much like this is how you write an essay. Well, can I do it this way? No, because that's not correct. I'm teaching you how to do it. And so she went in and noticed that and as she went along the spectrum and got all the way up to these affluent schools or these elite schools, what she realized is, is the hidden work was different and that every day it was conversations about, okay, so this is my goal. What do you need today? You know, what do you need from, from me? This is what I want to do, but like there's so many cool things we can do with it. I was thinking that we could do like a play and the kids are like, no, we did a play last time. Can't we go outside? Yeah, yeah, let's go outside. Okay, we first let's talk about, you know, what we agree to do together because if it doesn't work out, we're coming back in. And so what she said was, oh my gosh, these kids were putting a ceiling on what they're going to be capable of in life because we're teaching implicitly a group of people success means listening to your boss and being compliant and doing what you're told and never questioning it. And success for other people is chart your own course, make your own decisions, and fight until you get what you want. And that's the difference between a very low wage paying job and a CEO. And so when you're thinking about working with your students, what is the hidden message you're teaching them about success? Because is success showing up on time taking off your hat, saying please and thank you. Is that the only way to success? And I'm not in any way saying those things are not important. But if we're teaching that that is success, that someone else holds all the cards and decides what success is, is we're putting a ceiling on a lot of students. And if you use this, the parent lens and you think about that, it's the same way. We say you're a successful parent when you come to meetings when we schedule them. That means I'm the boss, there's a hierarchy there. I do my meetings at seven. You don't come, I don't think you're a committed parent. And this whole idea of is that what is our hidden curriculum saying? I care about your kid, you care about your kid, you tell me what you need to get here and I will damn well get it for you. Because without you, this kid is not gonna get where he needs to be or where she needs to be. So I need you. And this is more important than ever because now we have this focus on 21st century skills. And this is what I tried to model when I left the room for the first couple of minutes. So they're saying, if you want to be successful in this world, in a cognitive job, one that requires you to make your own decisions, you have to be a clear and effective communicator. Okay, which means that you have to know that different communication is different for you know, different purposes and different audiences. You have to be self-directed, okay? When given a goal, and someone leaves, you have to be able to make a plan. It means that you're creative, that you solve problems. One of the problems was all of these seats are, you know, where are we gonna put all these seats? Somebody at one point stacked them first. Somebody made the move to stack and other people saw that and they're like, oh, hey, I didn't think of that. I wouldn't have done it that way, but I'm gonna do it now. You know what that's called? Integrative thinking. Realizing that someone else thinks differently than you. Okay, and then you have responsible and involved citizenship, which is the idea of, wow, I wouldn't have done it that way, but that's actually really interesting. Oh, she, you know, she put her feet up, that's awesome, I'm gonna do that. And we learn through each other. And so this whole idea of 21st century skills is really aligned with UDL, because when we're thinking about designing and delivering an experience, whether it's for students or for parents, we have to think about all of these different things. Okay, we have to make sure that we provide options for how they're going to communicate with us. Okay, in our district, we send out an email newsletter. There are parents that don't have email, that don't check email, who don't have time to check email. Um, you know, you have a back to school night. Again, you're very dependent on things like transportation. This whole idea of, of do we really respect all parents and where they're coming from? I'm going to talk about an example of a district that I worked with in Ohio who I was talking about why don't some of your parents come and they said, well, they're incarcerated. I said, then go to the jail. They're not going, they're there. So why don't you go out there and do a presentation on what you're trying to do with kids in school and, and, and perseverance and then teach them how to write a meaningful letter to their kid and take it back and say, I met with your dad or your mom and they're lovely and look what they have for you. Like they know this is important. And that's what it means to, to respect diversity and variability is to say one barrier is you can't come here to support your child, but there are things that we can do. 
and this has never been scarier. So right now, in 1980, okay, this is from the Department of Labor Statistics. This was published two months ago, right after Donald Trump kept like a thousand jobs in the United States from the carrier deal. And this came out in NPR right afterwards. And you all have this presentation in the sketch, and that is a hot link if you want to follow it. But what ended up happening is they were saying, like, hooray, this is so great. Now we have all these factory jobs. And NPR and the Department of Labor Statistics was saying, no, this is not great because these jobs are going to be obsolete. And so in 1980, okay, we're up here, we're this blue line, this is called non-routine cognitive jobs, and these require 21st century thinking. Before we called it 21st century thinking, it required that. You know, to be an architect, to be a doctor, to be a teacher, you have to be creative. You have to respect the point of view of other people. You wouldn't be in those jobs if you weren't. Um, and then you have these two middle, and these are considered to be routine cognitive and routine non-cognitive. And these are jobs where you have a boss that's telling you what to do. And then you have this red lower line down here, which they call like a non-routine manual work. And those are kind of funny phrases, but that's how the Department of Labor Statistics uses them. And so when you were back in 1980, you had an equal opportunity. You know, 75% of the jobs were up here. And what has happened is the people on this line have become so good at self-directed creative problem solving, they have eliminated the need for all of these jobs in the middle. Because they have, these engineers have created solutions that eliminate the need for machinists. Um, these people up here have created transcription services, which will eliminate the need for an administrative assistant. Because you can transcribe your own law cases or, you know, police departments. They'll transcribe their own things. And so what's happening is they're saying that within the next 20 years, these three lines will meet and it will be a have and a have not and there will be nothing in between. So for parents who say, you know what, I did fine. Like I wasn't great at school and I had all these other options. The article was saying those options will be gone. We are preparing kids for jobs that don't exist, which will require the same 21st century skills that we're trying to push. And we need parents to be on our side to realize that. That this, this dream they want for their kids, this success, may not be the same success that they always imagined. Because we have to always look at what's forward. And so when we're thinking about our village, we're thinking about administrators, teachers, um, elected officials, community at large, and then the parents who, again, have the, the most stake in the game of these kids. They're their babies. And so when we think about why is this work important, why is it important to get parents involved, and then we need to teach parents what UDL is, what it is that we're trying to do in our districts, because it's micro failure for macro success. When you're going to have someone keep trying 10,000 times until they get it, there's going to be frustration. Okay? Jess Leahy wrote a book called The Gift of Failure, which is all about like, the critical importance of, of making mistakes and being able to regulate through those mistakes. And it's the same for parents. I know you've come in every year and you've had a horrible experience with your teachers, but I'm telling you, you have to try again. Let's keep doing this until we get it right. And then we're going to talk about how we're going to do this. And so when we're thinking about engagement specifically, we're trying to activate the effective network of our parent community. And the interesting thing is they vary very differently in what attracts their attention. And so we have to know what attracts their attention because it's all about recruiting interest. What are they interested in? Okay? And if they can, we can get them interested, we can start to build that engagement opposed to the compliance. Um, you know, even you as parents, you might go to a lot of parent things that you go to because you know you're supposed to. It's a compliance thing. It's not because you feel so passionately about being there, but you're like, oh, I'm supposed to go. Even that's a problem because you want parents like the ice cream truck, like psyched to come in and be a part of this work. Okay, and then we're gonna talk about how do you teach them what UDL is, or how do you teach them what growth mindset is, or how do you teach them what the report card says. And through all of this, you really need to, to think about multiple modalities. Okay, it can't just be on email. It can't just be at a back to school night. You need so many different ways to reach out that you're gonna hit everybody. And then lastly, you absolutely need to think about how can you get everyone to be a part of your long-term goal setting and to help you monitor your progress. And, and this is work that is, is fairly new for bringing parents into. You know, districts forever have had a, a vision and a mission and a, you know, many have a strategic plan or a district improvement plan or a school improvement plan. And this is largely done by an, an administrator. 
but it can't be because it's not the administrator's work. And so how do we involve parents in this planning? And so we're going to have some fun now and talk about some of the things that I've seen other districts implement. And you're going to think about your own parents and we're going to come up with some awesome ideas. But first of all, I want you to imagine that these are your parents, okay? These are your parents. Some of them are students, some of them are, okay, so you can see you have very young parents here, you have very old parents. You're just going to take this wide variability of this group, okay, and you're going to think about them for a second. And I want you just to imagine having one back to school night, which will meet the needs of all of these people. Okay, so we have a couple of young mothers, a young father, we probably have a grandfather who has custody of his children. Okay, and so that's what back to school night is. It's a one shot, one person standing up there, principal talks for 15 minutes, everyone moves between classrooms for 11 minutes, parents leave. But why? Why do we have back to school night? What is the goal? Let's start with the why. And if it's because you want parents to have a really great relationship with teachers, Back to school night's not the best format because you don't actually have relationships. And so, again, why? Is the why so you can see the teacher's face and get to know who you are? Well, there's other ways to do that. You can set up a video. You can send home a video. You know, you can invite people in. You can send videos out. Um, you could do uh, a little ditty at the YMCA at night. I mean, whatever you decide to do. But this is all about options. And so think about you have a back to school night. We're just going to take that as a very baseline. Okay. Why aren't these people coming? Okay, we're going to say, none of them came. And, and again, we're, you, we're kind of speculating, and you're not going to say, like, she didn't come because of this. But if this group didn't come, what are some possible barriers that prevented them from coming? So talk about it just for a couple of minutes. Why didn't these parents make it to back to school night? What are the barriers?
ACL at its core is designing experiences to remove barriers. And so the first step is always, what are the potential barriers? We don't know what the barriers are. We don't know these people. And it's the same thing with students. You're not designing for the students that you have in front of you. You're designing for any possible student who could walk in the door. So you start thinking about, gosh, I have this lesson. What could be some of the barriers that students would have? Oh, some kids might not know how to organize an essay, so I'll have an exemplar as an option. Some kids might not be able to read this um, because it's very rigorous. So I'm going to have it um, over there on audio, and then I'm also going to have an option of having a small group where I'll read it out loud. You know, some kids might not be able to sit still, so I'm going to have these wiggle seats. It's all about removing barriers all the time and so let's just think about and again it doesn't matter who the barrier is for but as a group let's say you're planning for back to school night which is one really small example but we're all planning for back to school night together and we're like okay so what are some of the reasons why parents might not come okay and let's talk about them what are some of them you can just yell them out okay okay right we yeah, don't care Right? But, I mean, there's literally, the list could go on. There's a million reasons why parents aren't going to show up. Now, the, the big thing first is why are we even having the night? Like, what's the purpose? And so once we know why we're having it, we need to say, okay, so it's really important for everybody to be able to meet that goal, even if they can't come. Okay, so the goal for parent teacher night is I want you know all parents to have a face-to-face -face conversation with teachers I want them to have a relationship with teachers and so you start thinking about well what are other ways we could do it it could be attend this night or sign up for a phone call or sign up for a conference or sign up for a video conference or meet at a coffee shop at this one hour that's in the center of town near the school that everyone can walk to for a half hour next week and this is when you're thinking about providing options but first you have to know wh why Okay, and so we start looking at these people and we start saying, okay, some of them might have work, some of them, okay, and so I want you to, sh I want to show you the, the, this protocol, it's called peeling the onion activity, and it's a, it's a cool way to do what we just did, and a, a cool way to do the, the procedure we just did, but basically we want to peel the onion, so if I were to say, I am going to have a parent community engagement strategy that gets every single parent to have a relationship with their child's teacher. That is the goal. Okay, now some people are going to say that's just not possible. It's just another way to look at it. And when I talk to teachers about it, I always say it's not you who's saying it's not possible. But imagine like the little angel on your shoulder and the little devil on your shoulder. And the devil is saying, no, you're not going to get them all. You won't. You're not going to get them all. Okay, that's when you say challenge accepted. And what options do I need to be able to get them all? And so that's just another way to think about how do we get parents involved in really building a community of learners. And in order to do that, we have to know why it's important to have their involvement. And the answer isn't because, oh, I think like someone said once that parents who are involved have kids who do better. We need to do the research. What does the research say? Okay, when you have the data and you're committed to it, then you create a plan that says, okay, now that we know in the research, these are the things that parents need to do. What are the barriers that are preventing them from doing that? And there's so many books on this right now. Um, Amanda Ripley wrote The Smartest Kids in the World and How They Got That Way. And the book is basically about what parent involvement matters and what doesn't, and you wanna know what doesn't matter? Parent participation in extracurricular activities. Zero impact on student success. And yet we, we want parents at science fairs and we want parents to volunteer at the classroom party and we want parents, you know, it, it doesn't affect student achievement. And so what does affect student achievement? It's how parents interact with their kids to teach them at home. And therefore we need to teach them how to be educators, which means that it really changes the lens of why we're involving parents in our community. We are not involving them in our community so they can see a teacher's face because them seeing a teacher's face is not improving the outcome of their kids, okay? And so we're crossing a line where we're all teaching the same people. And we deserve to hear each other and to be integrative thinkers and to hear what the parents are saying and we need them to hear what we're saying and then we both need to commit to action. And so it becomes a really nuanced thing where we go back to this why. Why, are, why do we need parents involved? And so what are some of the things? I always say, what if? 
So parents aren't engaged. And so we first of all need to find relevancy and interest. And so these are things that in districts that I've worked in or in districts I've worked with, we have tried. Um, okay, classic, I want parents to come in at night. We're gonna do a math workshop. We want all parents to experience the math workshop model so they know how to help their kids and what to say when they're struggling. Okay, that's, what, that's the why. We are having homework, we're sending home rigorous math problems, we want the parents to know what they can and cannot say, and we want them to know that after 10 minutes, if their kids are still struggling, they can stop. We need everybody on the same page. But we need to get their interest, okay? Some people call this a bribe, I call it engagement. So, um, districts have sent their buses around. Okay, Title I funds allow for transportation. Okay, send the buses around, the bus routes, they're going there anyway and pick up the parents who don't have transportation. Um, offer dinner. Again, you can, you can write in food and supplies into grants. So, you know, have a spaghetti dinner. One of the greatest things ever is National Honor Society kids have to put in community service hours. So we use, you know, National Honor Society kids to provide the tutoring and the childcare. There's still one teacher in the room, um, but you, they need hours. And so you're saying, okay, um, here's the deal. We're going to have a night. It's going to be really important. We want all parents to go. We're going to do a morning session and we're going to do a night session. We're going to send around the buses uh, an extra time in the morning. We can get you here. If that doesn't work, call us. We'll arrange for transportation. Um, but transportation is going to be provided. If you have little kids that aren't in school at the time and you want to come in the morning, we will provide childcare for them. We're also going to provide you with a meal. Just RSVP. Let us know who's coming. If you have older kids at night, we will provide tutoring from the Honor Society so they can come and bring their homework. Um, if they want to bring their devices and you want them in the corner, that's fine too. You know, you start thinking about what is it going to do to recruit interest. Things like raffles and prizes. As you come, you get to put your name in a raffle. And, and a lot of the times we, we don't think about engagement of parents as being something you have to design and deliver with the same integrity and passion as you do a classroom environment. And so again, these are just things. So um, two districts, when I worked when I was a teacher, we had like an ELL parent night. We had uh, parents of over 70 languages and are from 70 different places. And so you know, the first time we had it, it was like a bust, like 11 people came. And we sat and we're like, why didn't anyone come? And we started talking about all of these things. Like it's the language barriers. You know, we sent out the invitation in English. That was you know, not our best move. Um, you know, and so then we started talking about you know, having translators call, invite parents, sending things home with kids, teaching the kids to, to translate the letter into their language to send it home to parents. Um, and then we talked about bring a dish from your culture. Like we're gonna have an awesome potluck. When they came in, we had a huge map on the wall. We said, put a pin where you're from. People were realizing they were from the same areas. They didn't even know each other. You know, we came together. We had all the curriculum out. They could look at it. They could talk to parents, but we provided childcare. They, they, they brought dinner, they brought dishes. And it ended up that we were able to get like 70 times more people than we did the first time by universally designing the night. So that's engagement. Also, once we have them there, we wanna teach them something. Okay, and I don't know why you have them there, but you should have a reason. So once you decide that it's really important and you know what the why is, what is it they need to leave with? So I, 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 I roped them in with the why, like they're engaged, they're ready, and now I need to try to figure out, okay, now I, have to, now I have to share something. And so again, we go back to providing options. You have to do this in different ways. And so, you know, we, um, we go into the local community TV show. Everyone has one, like public access television. You know, do a little road show on that. Um, I, one really awesome, sneaky way to do this is to go to halftime at a football game because they're there. You know, parents are there and you come out, hey, just wanna share the new district strategy. This is awesome. We have so many cool opportunities for your kids to get SAT help. You know, just so you know, two minutes. You know, um, you know having parents come in and work on things with you. Um, in a couple of months in my district, I'm actually doing a UDL parent series at night. And it's gonna be the same thing. We provide childcare, we provide food. You know, come on in, learn what it is and learn why failure is important. Instead of helping our, you know, instead of always trying to have our kids avoid it, let's have them work through it. And let's try to get on the same page with that. So again, you're just thinking about, is it a presentation? Is it a TV show? Is it tweeting out things? Putting out as many things in the universe as you can. And then lastly, this whole idea of what are you going, how are you going to allow everyone to contribute in really personalized ways? These are my babies. Okay, so I have a, a, a seven-year-old, two twin six-year-olds, and that's my little one, he's two. And what I always, always said when I was teaching is somebody loves this kid as much as I love them. And as much as we don't agree with their style, 
or we don't understand their style or their culture because our bias is I think people should parent like me and I say a successful parent is one that does it like me, you have to know at your core that everyone loves their kids that much. And if they can't show it, it's because there's a barrier there that won't allow them to. And again, mental illness, addiction, these are real things. But we have to know that at our core, we really want the best things for our babies. And so when you're starting to think about this idea of how can we really encourage parents to come together with us, we have to start collaborating with all parents, parents who are incarcerated, parents in the parent-teacher organization. We have to start realizing that right now this is a huge weakness in American education. The Danielson model talks about family and community engagement. Every rubric there is talks about family and community engagement. But we think of it as parents coming in and not providing them with anything. And the definition of engagement, if we go back to it, is so much more than that. Engagement isn't getting their attention and getting them in. Engagement is getting them to commit to the long haul of helping their kids be the most successful people they can be. And we have to do things differently to do that. So just take a minute right now and, and to think about one concrete action step that you wanna take moving forward. Okay, maybe it's, I'm gonna call a meeting with my administrators. Maybe it's, you know what, I'm putting together a committee to do like the end of the school awards and we're doing it differently. We're gonna make sure every parent who, you know, can get, can meet the goal. Not every parent can get there. What's the goal? Firm goal, flexible means. Your goal is never, I want every parent in the room. That's not why the parents are there. There's a reason why you want the parents in the room, but you don't need them in the room to meet that goal. And so think about why you want your parents in and then think about what is your next step. You're gonna make like a UDL parent commitment. And it might just be, gosh, I just need to like go back to my school and talk about this with my colleagues, like this is crazy. And it might be, you know, maybe I'll send out a parent survey, you know, I'll send it out on paper at home and then maybe I can send out an electronic version and, you know, just to start getting some feedback as to like, are our relationships valuable? What do you feel like you want? Like, you know, we talked about what kind of teacher do you want? What kind of school do you want for you as a parent? What do you need as a parent? Because I mean, I know as a parent, like sometimes I feel lost with second grade homework. And I'm an educator who's very committed to this work and I wanna pull my hair out. And so what do I need from a district? So again, four minutes just to debrief. And I know that I didn't give you a very exact prompt, but it's all about what is your next step here when you're working with students? And so we're all going to kind of decide, we only have five minutes left, what is gonna be the next step? Are you gonna represent this differently? And then we're gonna just have five minutes for questions. And then again, um, if you wanna know any more at all in universally designed leadership, we talk about in our district how we really try from the very beginning to get parents involved, even at the very basic level of what is the vision of our district? What is the strategic plan? And a part of that strategic plan is family and community engagement, which we developed in partnership with families in our community. And so there's just so much work that we need to do to reach out because we can't do it alone. We can't make decisions. We need them to tell us what they need. So again, quick, 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 four minutes for you to chat, ask me questions, and then we'll be out of here. So just, I'll come around if you have any individual questions and then we'll, we'll open it up.
And we just talked about, this is so simple and so cool. So why do we have parent-teacher conferences? Can someone give me a good reason? Why do we have parent-teacher conferences? Historically, that seems like the right thing. Okay, that, I mean, that's probably why a lot of districts have, okay, but if we really dig deep, why do we have parent-teacher conferences? Can someone just give me a reason? There's probably a million reasons, there's no right answer. Okay, so we, we want to communicate with parents how their kids are doing. And we say, okay, so between 3 o'clock and, and 9 o'clock, you can sign up for an appointment. And I'm going to tell you here what the kids are doing. And we were just talking about just the very simple thing of having FaceTime slots. Like just how simple that is to say, I want at least a five minute check-in. It doesn't have to be longer than that, but I just want to talk to you about how you think your kid is doing so I can make sure you don't have any concerns. And then I want to tell you how I think he's doing and I would love to do this face-to-face -face in a meeting or face-to-face -face on FaceTime. If that doesn't work for you, we can certainly talk on the phone or email, but I'm going to use my work iPad. You don't have to give him your phone number. And these are the times. I'll call you. You just give me your number. And like even little tiny things like that, you're going to see your parent connections start adding up. But the, the importance here is really to start with the why. So are there any questions before we leave in two minutes? Can I just add to that? So then you're going to get that, you know, they say, oh, I don't have FaceTime. Yep. But there's Facebook. There are a billion ways out there for whoever's going to fuck your system to say, no, well, Yep. And again, and, and, and it's right now, and, and, and I, I mean, I think that I think in an innovative way, but we're not doing FaceTime conferences. Like, it's just, you have to just step back and think differently. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes, he was just saying that it's, it's not the tool you use. It's, it's not the meeting you have or what time you have the meeting, but the belief in the, your hidden curriculum of parent and community engagement is, yes, a lot of the times we do it for compliance. But if you're truly engaged and you truly believe that parent success is important, and read the research it is, what are you willing to do and to basically say I value where you're coming from I value that this is not the only way to meet with me and I would love to meet you in the middle because I value that so you tell me how to get in touch with you you know and if you don't have a phone you know are you going to the basketball game next week I'm going to be there let's you know meet for five minutes beforehand and obviously you have hundreds of students this becomes a little more of a challenge um, we used to do something on my teaching team when I taught seventh grade I was ELA there was math science social studies we used to do something called um, private mentoring silent mentoring and what we would do is we would go through every single kid on a list and cross out if we had a really good relationship with their parents and you would have 15 kids left out of the, the 150 that no one circled 
and then we'd split them. You know, just randomly. Okay, these are my five. I will meet with these five people. And then you start thinking about, because again, let's say you have hundreds, but you have, t we're on a team, we're in this together, this is a village. And so it's like this really magical opportunity to say, you know, oh, I always talk to this person all the time, I already talk to this person all the time, but there's this group left, and we haven't given them enough options or enough education to know that this is important work. And I value those people so much because I care about their kids so much that I will do whatever it takes. And that's the UDL mentality. It's not about, again, it's not about the app you buy or the book that you read or how you set up the room. It's everything you do to say, make yourself comfortable. I believe in you. Have faith in me and we're gonna do this together. So thank you so much for coming. Feel free to connect afterwards and I'll put the room back together. Don't even worry about it. <laughs>